why don't we start talk, capping off the show by giving some resources? Um, I mentioned Peter Lynch. I, I, I highly recommend everybody look at him for uh, investing advice and what his thesis is. And I like uh, Buffett. I agree with him less and less these days, but his his original philosophy is like, is, is still like some of the most sound investing advice ever. Like what we're talking about right now with the, um, with the cannabis Auroras, it's because these are businesses with zero barrier to entry, right? Warren's always saying, find a business that's got a moat, something that they do better than everybody else that they can't catch and invest in that company. When you invest in a company that's like, that's got no barrier to entry, everybody with, with a pocket cash can get into it. And that's what we've seen happen yeah. with, with weed. So, so, so find companies that have a moat and companies that have like an actual brand, like it's not just a commodity business, but also find companies that are profitable or that have a roadmap to profitability, or that have visibility of earnings in sight. A dividend's always great too. Uh, going back to Peter Lynch, he is fantastic. I have not talked about Peter Lynch with you on this show yet, but his book, One Up on Wall Street, if you're just getting into investing or you want even just to have just something nice to read, One Up on Wall Street is the greatest book just on retail investing and about investing in what you know. So I think that's great. I think Warren Buffett's great. We talked about Jeremy Siegel on your show before, and uh, his book is a really, um, really, really good book. It's called Stocks for the Long Run, and it's a little bit more in depth. It gives like more statistics and facts, but like that's a great book too that I'd put um, in your um, sort of repertoire or just on your bookshelf. Uh, what else can I think about? You don't have to learn how to read like how to read charts. You don't have to learn about Japanese candlesticks because like trading, like you have to establish, are you a trader or are you a long-term investor? Yes. So that's, right. that's that. What else can I think about? Um, I had something else. Psychology. Mm. Psychology is important. And just to like, you know, think about it as a chess match. If you're going to be doing any sort of trading, uh, and Kaylin's talked a lot about that. So for all of our viewers, if you want to go back and look at the reels and look at the previous videos, David and Kaylin have done some really good stuff on trading and market psychology. So I'd recommend to look at that and um, keep up with the news, keep up with politics um, and look at a variety of news sources. Because again, like things are narrative based. There's a lot of um, things that are biased just for clickbait, right? Yeah, I think uh, that's one mistake I think people need to really be conscious of. It's like, it's really easy and comfortable to think, okay, if I want to get into investing, let me pick up a few sources that I trust and just only listen to these uh, these sources. The, the problem is these sources can be biased, they could be wrong. And so you need a wide variety of resources for information just to get the clear picture. It's the, the truth is always somewhere in the middle, right? And going back to what you said before, because you said it so eloquently, man was just the fact that you have to go look through like everything. You have to go through um, all the news sources. You have to look at the actual company financials, or even if you can't do that, look through their investor presentations. Because if you look through an investor presentation, this is all stuff that's online. You can find out amazing things. You can find out about all the growth initiatives and the markets that the company's in, and you can find out about the board of directors and the people leading the company. So if you're not like looking at the investor presentations, that's really, really key. And that's a free resource on their website. That's great too. You can go on their earnings calls. So like, look at like everything and really do like a an approach, like make up your own mindset, look at everything yes. and look at, you know, the market, the economy, look at bond yields, start understanding the bond market, do some reading on that. I mean, there's really so much to do. Like this really isn't for everybody, but if you think that it is for you, look at everything and then make your own mind up, make your own opinion on it. And then you can act with conviction. Like you shouldn't be going on a chat room or getting a tip from someone and like forming an opinion on a stock or an asset class and investing like on a whim. You should be uh, really strategizing and being tactical in your research. So that when it's time to make a long-term investment or a trade, if that's what you want to do, that you'll have a good opinion and you'll have actual, um, like a leg to stand on. Yeah, I think that's that's important in so many ways. It's like I think um, if you don't, if you get into a position and you, you you didn't fully flesh out your thought process, or maybe if you didn't even have one, 
and the thing turned on you. You won't, you won't even know why or how you got you went wrong. But if you did your homework, it's fine to be wrong because if you did your homework, you'll know where you went wrong and then you can learn and you can iterate and then get better. So, so I think people need to realize that like investing isn't a side hustle. It's not something you do, you know, as a hobby, right? And you should really enjoy it. You guys were talking about um, like income streams and how people want to be like reliant, like not have a job and make money off trading in the stock market. For all of you guys out there, you're probably new investors out there. I want to tell you, you haven't seen a bear market yet. I'm not sure how long you've been trading for, whether it's six months, a year, maybe you went through COVID. I'm not sure, but you definitely didn't see 2015, 2016. You definitely didn't see 2011. You definitely didn't see 2008, 2009 or the dot com boom and bust. Uh, or you didn't, you know, read about that, became well versed and analyze all, all of the charts and all of the rhetoric and read, you know, firsthand accounts. Um, just be a student of the market and start to understand that there's going to come a point where there's going to be a real bear market in all assets. And there's going to come a point where like every day you're just going to feel shitty because the stock market's not going to be up every day and you're not going to make a 10% return every week or every month. And it's important that you recognize that now and prepare yourself for that. Like, I still think we have a long way to go and there's a lot of really good times ahead for us and that we're in a long secular bull market for equities, but the market's cyclical. There's bull markets and bear markets. At some point, the jig does stop. And that's what's happening with crypto right now and other asset classes. But um, just recognize. Sorry to cut you off, but I just, I just thought of something that's really funny. You are actually the optimist of the three of us. <laughs> and you're the one warning about downturns the most. I love it. Well, yeah, I mean, I do call myself the bull of Bay Street. I am really bullish on this secular bull market, but I understand that markets are cyclical. You don't go up in a straight line forever. We have downturns, we have corrections, we have bear markets, we have even depressions every, you know, like 100 years, whatever, to um, keep us in check. And a lot of these are black swan events. So I'm not going to predict what's going to be the next, you know, black swan event, the next hurricane or the next, you know, big uh, economic downturn. Like, I'm not going to predict that because no one knows. No one has a crystal ball. But if you have a nice disciplined approach to your portfolio and you're diversified and you're invested in good long-term companies that are going to be around 5, 10, 20, 50 years from now that have really good uh, you know, earning streams and you're getting dividends, you'll never have to worry. Yeah, I think... Uh... To start off with, I think people have to question if you want to invest um, to know if this is money that you're going to need in the short to medium term or, or long term, right? Because I think what's helped me be an investor is because all the money that I make, except for this one time, this Tesla purchase, all the money I make is for my retirement. I'm not trying to like, I'm not even trying to save to buy a house. This is all my retirement. And so thinking with that, with the, with the long time horizon helps me a lot with making long term decisions versus short term decisions. Like it's really helped me be patient. I think yeah. that if you wanted to structure it in a way where like X percent of your portfolio, I'm not going to go out giving asset allocations here, but if yeah. you're going to say X percent of your portfolio is for long-term and you're putting that in like the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ, or you're putting it in like really good blue chip stocks versus, you know, you put this percentage in like, this is my trading portfolio. This is for my you know, home run hits like this. Maybe I have like a little bit of crypto here, which like I'm not going to advocate for. But if you want that, then fine. You want to put some of these really speculative growth stocks that are trading at like crazy obscene valuations, like go ahead with that. But just know if that doesn't pan out, you always have like this left. And that's like your nest egg and that's your long term stuff. And over the long term, you know, I'm not going to tell you that a, a long term portfolio of like the S&P 500 won't be down over a one year period, because it definitely has, you know, or over a five year period, it could be down. But over like a 15 year period, that's never happened. Over a 20 year period, you're having like amazing gains and stocks have outperformed bonds and they've outperformed, you know, all sort of, you know, short term treasuries and they've outperformed the dollar and they've outperformed gold vastly. And it's going to outperform crypto too. You heard it from me first. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I also want to point out to people that, uh, uh, uh brennan is not against crypto he's just against bubbles and he's against hype 
because you 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 I think you're modest, but you make quite a bit of money in crypto. So <laughs> yeah, so I'm not gonna give uh, exact numbers, but I'll give time frames. I was yeah. super bullish on Bitcoin, and I was super bullish on the technical uh, sort of setup there. And I was investing when you were investing last year in like March, April, and May, and I was like establishing a very nice position in Bitcoin, and it was like you know mid four digits at that point right and then yeah. really quickly you know we had to deal with some summer volatility and very quickly you know five digits ten thousand twenty thousand thirty thousand forty thousand 000, 000, 000. and at that point i said this is getting too hot i'm seeing a lot of these new crypto uh coins start to come to market and the whole premise for me was that Bitcoin was not a currency, but it was a store of value. There's only 21 million Bitcoin that can ever be mined. And that's great because I'm able to grab a couple of those Bitcoin and kind of make them mine. However, when you have like Dogecoin minting 14 million coins per day and you have like, what's the token supply of Shiba Inu token? Several hundreds of trillions of tokens. That completely undermines Bitcoin's fixed supply and completely diminishes that uh, low supply because like what differentiates Bitcoin from all of these other coins at this very moment, at this very moment, none. So I was able to, um, uh, I was able to get out of that position. I was able to put it for something I was more comfortable in. I didn't time the top um, completely right, but I got close enough that I was super happy with that. And I envision a point where Bitcoin's going to go even lower than that point. Um, so right well, now, I'm definitely bearish on crypto. There's no well, doubt about that. I want to make a point. You, you just mentioned something that's really interesting. Like, I, I want to make a point to people that you don't have to time the top. Because oh, no. here it is playing out, right? You didn't, you didn't even think about timing the top. But what, did, what, what, did, what happened afterwards was that you were able to now take that money, that profit, and make other investments. There are always other opportunities. I think people forget that. It's like, yeah, Bitcoin's going up right now. I think they're going to, uh, about it with the mentality that this is a one-time thing. I, I don't know why, but like, there's always other opportunities. The trick is to have money available to to seize those opportunities. Well, look at your Tesla. You were investing during that like three-year grueling consolidation phase, but you knew that it was a solid company. You knew that it was undervalued, and you knew that people weren't acknowledging something about Tesla. So that's what I was doing right now. I was reallocating dollars towards a trade that really panned out that I wasn't comfortable anymore, that too many people were getting involved with. Like I said, markets go up with the least amount of people and down with the most. And I was able to reallocate that in less crowded trades, trades that are undervalued, that the herd isn't there yet. And I was able to put those there and just wait and just chill out because those trades will end up working at some point. I mean, they already are, but let's just wait for the NASDAQ to breach that 14,000 level. And like I said, the larger the consolidation, the larger the breakout. And that's exactly what's going to happen here. You know, we're talking about a 16 year consolidation on the NASDAQ, 16, 17 year, some point that's going to break out. And like I said, uh, on the other side of the coin, too stretched above moving averages, eventually the moving averages meet. And I'm not sure at what level, but I think it's price that's extended. So I think it's going to be uh, price correction uh, plus time consolidation. And like, that's where I stand on Bitcoin. There's really not much else that I can say about that. And when I'm, you know, um, giving people a hard time for Bitcoin, it's not directed at Bitcoin. It's uh, directed at the animal spirits, as we call them on Wall Street, the herd mentality, and the thousands of other coins that just, you know, sprouted out of nowhere that just as quickly as they came are going to go and disappear. Yeah, I think uh, I think we can end it there. So I, what, what do you think our uh, unifying message this episode was? Uh, psychology? Should we call it psychology? But the most I'm going to have thing? to look back and uh, kind of think about everything that we talked about. We talked about a lot. Well, we really touched on inflation. We really touched about market psychology. Um, and we talked about bubbles, a lot about bubbles. Yeah. Oh, I'm really looking okay. forward to next week. It was a great episode. We have a lot of earnings this week. We have a lot of the Asian companies, uh, the Chinese companies like Tencent and JD.com reporting this week. 
Uh, we have some of the um, video game companies like Take Two Entertainment this week. As well, we have some of the retail companies like uh, Walmart and Home Depot. Um, uh, they're reporting earnings this week. So we're going to have a lot to talk about next week. Hopefully, we'll have Kalen back. And as always, uh, I really appreciate it, David. Yeah. Great to and, and by the way, you said something earlier that I think I, I said something on my show. No, this is our show. We're we're all a team now. So welcome aboard. All right. Perfect. All right, well, YouTubers. All right, yeah. YouTubers. See you guys next week.